Biodiversity is one of the more important research areas in biology and paleobiology, especially given concerns about wildlife conservation and related issues. Uh, these slides discuss what we know about long-term trends in marine biodiversity and outline some of the challenges that are associated with counting and quantifying diversity in the fossil record. The fossil record is the only way that we have to reconstruct past diversity. You might be wondering, well, how hard can this be? I mean, you just count the number of taxa. Well, you'll see in the next few minutes how it's actually a pretty complicated subject. The first diversity curve was produced more than 150 years ago. Uh, John Phillips basically counted up the number of taxa in the British fossil record to make this curve. And it's actually not too different from our current view, although obviously not as detailed as we now know. Uh, it recognizes things like the Permian extinction and the Cretaceous extinction. So intuitively, diversity seems straightforward. You just collect a bunch of fossils and then count up the number of species present. But it's actually deceptively a lot more involved than that. So more recently, in the 70s and the 80s, Jack Sepkoski and others, they took a more modern look at diversity, compiling a huge amount of information to produce a cur this curve here of marine family-level diversity. And so this famous Sepkoski curve, as it's called, uh, has raised a number of interesting questions about diversity and, and controls on diversity. So there's a similar curve, but at the genus level instead of the family level using the same Sepkoski data. Uh, one thing you'll notice is the Cenozoic increase is much larger at this taxonomic level than it was in the previous family level curve. So in both curves, both this one and the previous slide, diversity is, is fairly constant from the late Ordovician uh, through the Permian. Called, this has been called the Paleozoic Plateau. And it's raised the question, does this imply that there's some sort of carrying capacity or limit on how many species can be present, or genera in this case? Um, However, this Mesozoic and Cenozoic increase just blew, back, blew right past that limit. So did the carrying capacity change? If it did, why did it change? These have been big unanswered questions for 20, 30 years. Well, those questions can only be answered if the diversity pattern actually reflects the true history of diversity. And this was a big worry even back in the 70s when this work was really starting. Maybe fossil preservation was lower in the past, there are also more exposures of younger sedimentary rocks, too, so people wondered, perhaps, if diversity actually reached its present-day value pretty early, this equilibrium model curve of, of Raup, and maybe the fossil record just re results from various preservation biases instead. Well, those issues of fossilization and the amount of exposed rock and so forth may be important, but there's even more fundamental problems with how curves like the Sepkoski curve have been constructed. So they use this method of, of counting tax they called range through counting. It's called that because the data are ranged through from their first and last occurrences. And this method was used because the data sets that the, those people were working with only recorded first and last occurrences of a taxon. So in range through counting, the diversity of a time interval, for example, this gray box, is based on everything actually recorded as a fossil in that interval, the red, the three red dots you can see in the gray box, plus everything that's found both before and after. It would be the two dashed lines that range through the interval but are not actually recorded within that. So this would seem to make sense, as any taxon that was present before and after an interval must have been alive somewhere during that time, but it actually causes problems. One big problem, and this actually affects all types of diversity counts, is variation in the amount of sampling. So as you learned in Lecture 3 on diversity and in your environmental reconstruction project and paper, and is illustrated in the left-hand graph here, collecting fossils were, will invariably reveal more species. And so you've also learned in previous classes how species have different environmental tolerances, and how larval dispersal limitations can produce biogeographic differences between species in different parts of the world. So also sampling from a greater range of environments or regions can also increase diversity in, in a time interval. So as a result, well-sampled time intervals will have a lot of these one-timer taxa, that is, ones that only occur in a single time interval, 
but some of those taxa may also have occurred in earlier or later intervals if you just sample those other time periods better. So there are ways of addressing sampling intensity, but those methods require more than a record of just first and last occurrences. We'll get back to them very briefly later on. So returning to this sampling idea of, of rock volume bias, um, if more rocks of a given age are exposed, that means that there are more opportunities for fossil collecting, and therefore probably more specimens have been collected. The correspondence that you can see between diversity curves, which show this big increase in the Cenozoic in particular, um, and measures of rock exposure, here this, this bar plot shows exposure as square kilometers of outcrop divided by the duration of the geological time intervals, you get kilometers squared per year. Um, the fact that those two curves have some broad similarities does raise concerns. Range-through curves also suffer from other problems, such as edge effects. So remember that the stratigraphic range of taxa always contain gaps. And so these taxa can be called Lazarus taxa because they appear to go extinct and then later come back from the dead, like the biblical character of Lazarus. So in range-through counting, gaps in the middle of ranges, which are the x's, are actually counted towards diversity. But you've seen in the biostratigraphy lecture, and also in the previous lecture on extinctions, how there can be unknown gaps before or after a taxon's true range. So the true range is always longer than the observed range. So those unknown edge gaps, for example, these gray X's here, cannot be counted towards diversity, so they artificially reduce diversity towards the edges of a time series. You can also think of it this way. Uh, to recognize a gap, or to recognize a Lazarus occurrence, you need to have at least one fossil record before, and at least one fossil record after that time period. So a gap in the middle of our time series um, has many intervals before and after, so the good chance of finding a fossil at least once before and at least once after. But as you move towards an edge, say as you move towards the beginning of your time series, there are fewer and fewer time periods before that gap. So that means there's less chance of finding a fossil on that side of the gap. So these edge effects are a big issue for these, these range through curves. There's a related issue and, and a related edge effect, and that comes if data from the living fauna are included. And this is sometimes done and it causes an edge effect called the pull of the recent. So imagine fossil ranges like these, uh, the, the red dots connected by the, the lines, and they produce a range through diversity curve with the edge effects that you see, like the curve on the left. If we add data from the modern, however, which are these dots here, it allows us to extend the ranges of certain taxa like this. So our new diversity curve now looks like this dark red line, and it is progressively inflated or, or larger as you approach the present day on the right-hand side of, of our plot. So that bias occurs because these range extensions that we just did are asymmetrical. Many of the taxa that we range to the present probably also um, occurred earlier than the oldest recorded fossil, as you've, as you've learned. But we can't extend their ranges in the older direction. So also, these more recent taxa are more likely to occur in the living fauna, so range extensions preferentially help younger parts of the record. Imagine that a taxon living in the Miocene is probably likely to be alive today, and so we can extend its range. A taxon in the Ordovician had a longer range than we observed, but we can't extend it because we don't have an extremely well-sampled interval like the present to do so. So this pull of the recent is a bigger problem for groups with poorer fossil records, so like insects, and it's less of a problem for things like bivalves, which ha are much more likely to fossilize. So it turns out that the best method for counting diversity actually ignores those Lazarus taxa, and only counts the taxa that are recorded actually as fossils within the interval. So that type of count is called sampled in-bin diversity. That method, however, can't be calculated just from first and last appearances. You actually need all the records of a taxon. And so it's prompted development of new databases, like this paleobiology database here, to contain records of all of those occurrences. This sort of database, which contains these occurrence records, also 
allows correction for variations in, in sampling intensity. So here's a marine invertebrate diversity curve based on paleobiology database data using sampling standardized and sampled in bin diversity. So the overall picture is similar. The data are quite noisy here, uh, but some of the important features of the previous curves are gone. Notice there is no Paleozoic plateau. Instead, there's sort of Devonian and Permian peaks. So discussions of carrying capacity that we might have had from the Sepkoski curve are maybe less important or maybe not even necessary at all. The Mesozoic to Cenozoic increase is present, but it's much less pronounced. It probably looked so large in the Sepkoski data because the Neogene, for example, is extremely well sampled. So this curve likely isn't the end of the story either. Um, there's going to be continued work on better ways of counting and sampling the fossil record, uh, but for something as simple sounding as, as counting species, this lecture hopefully gives you some idea of the various biases and challenges that have to be overcome to reconstruct the true history of diversity on Earth.